Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, August 25th, 2019. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we're so glad you have joined us today. Some of you are brand new to the fellowship. We've mm-hmm. been noticing the numbers going up and up every week since we started back in this. So I think some people have just waited until we started with Genesis again. <laughs> we're, we're getting a lot of notes from all over, which is truly a blessing. Um, got a note this morning from Adelaide in, in South Australia. Uh, received a note the other day from Norway. Uh, note from Scotland. Uh, know, one from Ireland. So thank world. you. Thank you for joining us. You you would laugh if you saw how uh, we put this together on Sunday mornings. Um, we, we would not go to church dressed as we are right now. Trust me, we wouldn't. Especially, <laughs> we really wouldn't. But uh, um, we also... Honestly, we still sort of operate on a very tight budget. Right. And it isn't because we're trying. It, be, be, it isn't because we don't have a little bit of money. Oh, no, God has it's provided just, for God us. God has yeah. provided well for us. But um, we try to be very good stewards of what he does give us. And so we don't spend a whole lot of money on equipment. We buy only what we really need mm-hmm. to get by. And, and it's amazing how the Lord has provided uh, inexpensive solutions to uh, uh, get to to get this to you. Right, right. I mean, we've got it. We got a consumer grade iMac over here. A couple of microphones. An which old are, consumer grade iMac. Yeah, it was a 2013 thing, version, 2014. Yeah. Um, but still, you know, enough power to do the job. Um, these microphones are, are decent, but they're not broadcast quality. No. But for the difference between these microphones and a broadcast quality mic, yeah. uh, it wouldn't be worth the additional $300. Generally, so, professionals al- um, only would be the ones who would right, say, yeah, I can right. tell the difference there. Yeah, but, you know, it's the quality of what you say and uh, just making sure that the audio is clean enough for people to hear it without distraction. So, so here true. we are. So, and we're glad you're out there. You know, the Lord has so, so blessed us because we have become a huge family, Gilbert mm. House has, mm-hmm. and, and we've seen that expand with our new Skywatch TV production, Unraveling Revelation. We have seen tens of thousands of you. We, we are just amazed by that number. Stunned, Stunned is a good word. Yeah, is a good word. <laughs> but we know that it, it, these are folks out there who are hungry for um, to learn about God's Word and yeah. that's what makes Derek and me so excited. Right, right. That you are getting hungry for God's word. Mm-hmm. Because that's what drove us to do this in the first place. Yes. Back in 2013, 2014, when we were speaking at conferences a couple of times a year, we would um, hear from people who'd say, "You know, we don't, we can't find a church near us that's teaching verse by verse exegesis from the Bible." And uh, so Sharon suggested that we we start this back in in 2015, and, and so we did, and. Uh, 2014. 2014. You're right. It was before the uh, end of 2014. Uh, Maybe even been 2013. It was a long time ago. Um, I think we've been doing this for over a year by the time we moved. Yeah. Well, we'd have to go back and look at uh, the the old. Uh, we don't know. Yeah, we were we still in Illinois when we started. Each yeah. Morning. Anyway, the, the point is that that's what led us to start this, and it, it's been growing and growing. We've been all the way through the Bible once, and now we're back in the Book of Genesis and uh, and finding that having been through the Bible all the way is really what informs what we're doing with Unraveling Revelation. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find that at Skywatch TV, or if you, if you just want to go direct to it, the, e- the easy way to remember it is just unravelingrevelation.tv. Yes. and All uh, the videos are there. Right. Uh, and then from there, that also links back here. It also links over to Sci Friday and, and so, so on. So you can also find but, it at gilberthouse.org. Mm-hmm. Everything we do is there. Right. That is the... Uh, <laughs> the hub, the worldwide command center, um, <laughs> ha ha. Uh, so it's Sam's website. <laughs> but the thing that the thing that's really exciting, and you pointed this out this morning, is that had we not gone through all all the way through the Bible the first time, that diving into Revelation before we had done that and seen the threads and how they connect, and and done the research into the cultural and historical context in which these books were written, would not have made as much sense of of Revelation as what we're getting now. We, and we'll say up front, we don't. We don't have it all figured out. No, we don't. Absolutely not. We have lots of questions. Right. And that's where knowledge starts. Right. You start by asking a question. Yeah. Uh, And I'll say this also, though. Anyone who says that they've completely got the book of Revelation totally figured out is is mistaken. Yes, exactly. Uh, Because... 
Only only one being in this in this whole yes. world can say that, and he's the one who created it all. So right, right. We'll we'll, we'll give him kudos for being the one who knows it all. But we're promised a blessing for studying that, for studying God's word. and Exactly, just for hearing it. So right. when you only hear the word spoken, and we've already been through the book of Revelation, mm-hmm. we've learned a lot since then. Yes. So we're excited to get back to it. But uh, boy, it, the, the, the Bible is so deep and amazing right. and rich. And the more we learn about the archaeology of the ancient world, the more it reinforces the the narrative in the Bible. Which is why and we go back to Israel every year. Right. And ultimately that narrative leads to God returning, the Messiah returning, and establishing finally righteousness on earth. Those who have rebelled, those who reject him, those who have mistreated our brothers and sisters. And, and even, you know, the things that we have done, you know, there, there will be a day when all the chaff in our lives will be burned up and uh, that won't be pleasant. Oh, but such but, a bonfire for my life. <laughs> we, because I've made a lot of mistakes. All of us have. All of us have. Um, but all of these accounts will be settled. And no matter what you've done, and, and this is the, the ultimate takeaway, no matter what you have done to this point, there is still salvation for you. There is yes. still redemption out there. Yes. Um, that is the point of it. the wonderful book by Donna Howell and Tom Horn, uh, Redeemed Unredeemable. Yes. Even the worst among us, if they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and repent, can be saved. And that is an amazing, amazing thing. You can have assurance, that blessed assurance of knowing that your future is secure. And that's the ultimate takeaway from God's word is that uh, he has a plan to bring us home and restore us to his family. He does. He does. How wonderful. Praise God. Lots of stuff to talk about today, so shall we pray? Absolutely. Father, we thank you for bringing us together through uh, through this medium, and we are grateful for all who have um, turned to this to get a better understanding of your word. We are grateful for your Holy Spirit, which grants us what little wisdom we possess. Father, we just pray for better understanding of your word. Help us to rightly divide it, adding nothing to your word, taking nothing away from it, Lord. May it be a a blessing and just reassurance, Father, for the faith that we have placed in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the way, speaking of prayer, I just want to very quickly update those of you who've been praying for me as I recover from shingles. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm on day 34. (laughs) And trust me, when you have shingles, you do count the days (laughs) because each day you make it through is a victory. And, And I know the prayers that you guys have been lifting up to the Lord for me have made a huge, huge impact on my ability to recover. Um, I, honestly, it's it's not pain free, but it's it's so tolerable now mm-hmm. that I'm able to get back to most of the things that I normally do, and that includes writing, and and that's a big thing that's been on mm-hmm. my heart, and I've I've really had a burden over because being ill, I wasn't able to finish my book, book six of the Red Wing Saga, as quickly as I wanted it to. So uh, I'm I'm really working hard to get it done. Mm-hmm. Uh, Derek and I have uh, a very hard deadline for releasing our new book that we wrote together that is called Veneration. Mm -hmm. The previous title had been Profiling the Dead. You may have heard of talking about that. But uh, it's being released by Tom Horn along with book six of Red Wing Saga. So we're very excited about that along with the travel documentary of our trip to Israel. My next uh, venture finally got through cataloging the, um, the video and finding where we did the uh, where we did the talking and we went we we were speaking earlier before the prayer about archaeology mm-hmm. backing up the bible and we saw some great sites that are going to be in that video oh yeah uh, one of them Josh was altar that was incredible getting our pictures taken on top of that uh, yes. reconstruction was um, amazing and, yes. and knowing that some of those stones were the stones over which Joshua and the Israelites said as for me and my house and we got that on video i was i, I no. I was looking for that video where we all got to say speak that those words together. I thought we had it. We we did. We did. It's just getting the stuff back from Apple's iCloud is taking a lot yeah, longer than I thought. Well, it was it's a lot of content yeah. I have to download. But many, uh, many and it's it's in four K, so it's big files. Right, right. Um but speaking of uh archaeology, mm-hmm. if you wished 
you could have gone with us this year to Israel. And you're thinking, boy, when they go again, I'm going to try to go. We are returning in October of 2020. Right. And the extension this year, for those of you who want to pay the little extra to go to the extra part of the the second half of the tour, we're not going to Jordan this year. Mm -hmm. We are going to Sardinia. That's right. We're going back to Sardinia. We had such an amazing time with the crew from Gen 6, um, Timothy Alberino, uh, Steve Quayle, although Steve wasn't there, he sent his son Tyler in his place. And, and Tyler's a whole lot of fun. He is. Uh, but the sites on Sardinia are so incredibly, uh, just mind-boggling. You will suddenly, especially if you see the sites in Israel, several of the sites, the archaeological, uh, mm-hmm. sorry, sorry, the construction style is the same. Right. So the connection between Sardinia and the Holy Land. And the Amorites. And, and, and the Amorites. And this is something that Mike Heiser, and I, I know we're... we're uh, you know, rabbit trailing, rabbit trailing but, but it's okay um, because this relates to things that we're going to get into later in the book of Genesis and Deuteronomy and Joshua as we deal with the people that Israel had to push out of the land. Yes. Mike Heiser's presentation at the conference, the Sons of God Giants of Old Conference last weekend in Lubbock, Texas, which by the way is why we didn't do a fellowship last weekend. I was in Lubbock. Um, his presentation on the Sea People's in the land. Yeah. The Sea Peoples were a group of raiders that came out of the Aegean, so the area between Greece and Turkey, uh, around 1200 BC. And the, the Hittite Empire collapsed. The Amorite Kingdom of Ugarit was destroyed. They almost, almost destroyed the Egyptian Kingdom. Ramses III, who was the son of Ramses the Great, was able to hold them off. And they settled. The Philistines settled in what is now the, the area of the Gaza Strip. But there were other people who are mentioned in uh, Genesis and and Joshua, Deuteronomy that had to be pushed out of the land, like the you know just mysterious people like the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Avites, or the Avim, mm-hmm. uh, the Horim. Where did they come from? And Mike was able to draw on academic papers and show that they were essentially all part of that same group. And there was a book written uh, about forty years ago where a scholar documented all of this and shows linguistically, etymologically, where they all came from. Point is that there was a lot more cross-pollination between the Western Mediterranean and the Holy Land than we thought, which helps explain what was going on in, on Sardinia. So uh, anyway, that that will be part of uh, the tour next year, and we'll, we'll have more details as they become available. But uh, start start thinking now about next October, October of 2020. Yeah. Because those connections are amazing. It's going to be ex- so. It's so, so exciting. And now we are going to get the history that actually will eventually lead us up to the Amorites. That's right. We go back into the book of Genesis. We left off at Genesis 7, which, um, well, that, that number is repeated again here in Genesis 8. So we'll get back to it here in just a moment. Um, Genesis 8, uh, we, we left, when last we left Noah, he and a whole bunch of animals, he and his family and a whole bunch of animals were crowded into an ark. Um, the, by the way, the Ark Encounter in uh, in Kentucky, mm-hmm. near near Cincinnati, if you get a chance to go there, go check it out sometime. Oh, wow. Because it really is, I mean, this is not cheesy at all. This is really extremely well done. They they brought in a bunch of, of uh, Amish craftsmen because there, there, aren't, there isn't anyone else in America or North America who knows how to build with wood the way the Amish do. Yeah, amen to that. And they, yes, they used some steel reinforcement to make sure that, that it was safe. But for the most part, this is all wood construction built in a way that uh, probably would have been available to uh, know. A lot uh, of research men. was done. Yeah. Uh, and when you see how big this thing is, you begin to realize, yeah, they really could fit all of those animals in there because mm-hmm. it's huge. Yeah. It is huge. Uh, Genesis chapter eight. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. Now, the w- word wind, is that ruach? Because that, uh, well, great, my uh, my app's not going to let me bring up it the... It is uh, ruach. Okay, so that's a word that's often translated spirit, as in the spirit of God. Yes. Uh, so, God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed... And as we mentioned before, this is a connection to Mount Hermon, where it was believed by the later um, Jews and the people around that the flood came from Mount Hermon because you had the uh, mountain 
uh, connecting into the clouds, which yes, are the, the... it was the Amphalos. Right. The, the navel of the earth. F- the, the windows of heaven, the fountains of the... The, the, the waters uh, heaven, above. Right, the waters above, and then the waters below, the Jordan River. Exactly. At the time, came directly out of that cave of Pan, the Grotto of Pan. Exactly. And you have to remember that the God who controls the waters above and the waters below mm-hmm. is the head of the Pantheon. It is right. the storm God. So essentially, what the Lord is is doing, what Noah, sorry, Moses is telling his readers here, mm-hmm. his listeners, is that that was Yahweh. Right, right. And in, in, in the Canaanite pantheon, actually, it was the creator god El. Oh, yes, that's the, right. The sun was the storm the god. The sun was the storm god. He was the king of the pantheon, but El was the creator. And his tabernacle, his uh, mount of assembly was at the, the source of the double deep or the two deeps. Yes. Which, again, re- recalls that psalm, deep calls to deep. Exactly. Yeah, we're not, exactly. We're not talking about deep thought or deep spiritualism. No, here. we're, we're, not. Talking, we're about, talking about a, a, a mythological belief, right? a pagan belief mm-hmm. that echoes the truth, which is Yahweh controls the waters above yes. and the waters below. He is the creator. Mm-hmm. And of course, later on, he does say, not only am I the creator, I'm also the storm god. <laughs> yes. Because and, he is the father and the son. And I send the plagues and, uh, you know, yeah. I could do all mm-hmm. right. Yeah. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Okay, let's stop right there. And it's not because of the mountains of Ararat. Ararat. Yes. There is another phrase in here that I... I looked at it last uh, two weeks ago, and you and I both said, was that always in there? Yes, the 150 days, because it struck me as we're reading this, like, wait a minute, let's check Revelation 9. And sure enough, when the creatures, the creatures, I argue that those are the watchers, the the titans of Greek myth, the Apkalu of Mesopotamian myth, who who were likewise confined to the abyss, when they're released... Yes, I know they look like locusts, and we think of the Watchers as angelic, so they must look human. The Titans, they were depicted as humanoid. No, the Mesopotamian Apkalu, which was the what the Mesopotamians called the Watchers, were theriomorphic. They were human animal hybrid, winged uh-huh. humanoid, or a uh, a winged humanoid with a with a like a hawk's head, um, and that's theriomorphic a combination hybrid animal human is what these locust like yes. things look like coming out of the pit. Um, when we get to Revelation, we'll talk about that again. And I know that uh, late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey, who, God bless him, got people excited about reading Bible prophecy again. Got me um, into it. But I think we we look for naturalistic explanations for those things. We're missing the point. That's when the rebels who were punished, um, the angels who sinned, who, who did not obey, for, uh, as Peter put it in Second Peter 2, uh, who formerly did not obey in the days of Noah, mm-hmm. um, that's, that's their first estate. That's right. That's who comes out of the pit. And they're given the power to torment uh, humanity with the, the power of the, the stings in their tails for five months. Five months. And I believe this is a reversal. Yes. Yet another reversal. And if you have never read Mike Kaiser's ding, 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 boy, mm-hmm. he's been mentioned a lot in this one, <laughs> reversing Hermon, you must, because he nails it and mm-hmm. it's no pun intended because he talks about how the lord reversed many of the things that the fallen realm did right and we see it now that we realize that thank you mike mm-hmm. we have seen that over and over again in the old testament exactly so here in genesis 8 you have the earth being restored over a period of five months as the waters recede in the book of revelation revelation 9 when the faithful are removed from earth's because earth because we're not uh, we are not appointed unto wrath so we won't be here when god's judgment and the torment from these uh, entities is released on the earth uh, we'll see the earth essentially coming under judgment as these entities that are that have been uh, confined in kept in chains in gloomy darkness according to peter and jude they will have 5 months to take their revenge on the children of men. They saw in the flood of Noah, their children destroyed. The Nephilim. Exactly. And that's what I want to go on this. In in chapter seven of Genesis, we see this number again, that it prevailed over the earth for 150 days, the mm-hmm. waters. It takes here 150 days for them to subside, for them to recede. Right. Oh, that's right. The w- waters think... prevailed on the earth and then the waters abated at the end of 150 days. Yes. So, right. 
Now, I believe if you picture the scenario of these larger-than-human entities, mm-hmm. these hybrids who are being destroyed along with the man, the mankind who refuses to repent, mm-hmm. that these entities probably climbed higher and higher and higher as the waters rose. Right, right. They were trying to escape them because they would drown. Mm-hmm. Because you can only tread water for so long. That's right. Even if you are a very strong hybrid entity, mm-hmm. you can only do it so long. So imagine them climbing to the tops of the highest mountains on earth and the waters rising high enough above those peaks yes. to force these entities to tread water. And then how long could they do it? Exactly. Probably longer than a human. So I believe it took 150 days for them to die. Right. And Genesis 7.24 makes it, or 7.18 rather, makes it clear that this, this is what happened. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. 19, verse 19. The waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. Exactly. So I think that the the watchers the ones who were thrust down to Tartarus, mm-hmm. they watched their children die mm-hmm. over this 150... They watched them panic, run, over 150 days. Now, the Lord was right to kill them. Yes. But the parents are enraged and blame mankind along with Yahweh mm-hmm. for what happened to their children. So when the Lord opens the abyss, he allows them out they get 150 days, Yes, one day for every day their children suffered. Right. And just to make it clear, because we know that on our solar calendar, five months is not exactly 150 days, but in the ancient world, everybody operated on the lunar calendar. This a is, month was 30 days. Exactly. This is often referred to by biblical scholars as the prophetic calendar. 360 days is a year in prophetic calendars, Mm -hmm. which is why in the book of Revelation, you'll see 1,260 days. You'll see, uh, uh, what is it, three and a half years. You'll see numbers that add up to 360 days in a year Mm -hmm. or 30 days in a month. So at the end of 150 days, the waters had abated, and in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. This is interesting. The waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. What is the seventh month? Well, the seventh month is the month of Tishrei. The 15th of Tishrei is the beginning of Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. That's what I was thinking, that this is getting into uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, but also preceded by Rosh Hashanah. Yes, Rosh Hashanah is the first of Tishrei. So it's like this new beginning begins Mm -hmm. at the head of the, the... a created year. Mm-hmm. Because now, Rosh Hashanah is when Adam was created. Mm-hmm. When, uh, and here's what I was thinking, though. I was doing a little math in my head, and uh, we'll we'll have to ch- check this with Jonathan Kahn. It's kind of a running joke at Skywatch TV. <laughs> he, he even is in on it. He says, yeah. you guys need ma- you know, a refresher on your Josh, math. Josh, keep your I'm phone out so you can use your calculator. Um, <laughs> first day of the 10th month was when the tops of the mountains were seen. Um which again were the high places that were considered sacred to these pagan entities, pagan gods. That means the months, the eighth and ninth months, that's 60 days. 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest, which means there were 12 more days. And so 72 days ah, from the time it hit until. Is it 72? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So 18, 19, 20. Because then, we have. Well, no, no, 73. Okay, so oh, day, okay. Okay, so 73 days. Okay. I was going to say, math. 72 uh. would be really, really yeah. interesting. Okay, strike that from the record. <laughs> we'll move on. We might we, have to dig deeper into that, though, because it's so close to that number. Well, and the interesting thing is that they note the specific days, and that's why I did it, because when there are numbers mentioned or specific dates mentioned, it's not for filler. There's some reason that we just don't perceive yet. So, exactly. Um, uh, maybe they counted it differently. But you know, it was the seventeenth day of the month, so the eighteenth would have been the first day, eighteenth, nineteenth, twentieth, and then you've got ten more. So yeah, it would have been yeah, it would have been seventy three days. Mm. So anyway, verse six. At the end of forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Didn't come back. No. Yeah. 
ravens. No, they never do. Yeah. Uh, Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited. Can I raise my hand for a second? Going back to verse 7, it's a really interesting verse. Because you have this raven, and it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Yeah. So it just kept flying. Apparently, yes. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the dove was like, no, nah, I'm not, nah, I'm going back to the ark. <laughs> I know where my snacks come from. Um, so, verse 9, dove found no place to set her foot. She returned, him, she returned to him to the ark, uh, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he, Noah, put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came back to him in the evening. And behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. (laughs) And a feather from a raven. (laughs) (laughs) So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, so they'd been in basically resting inside the ark on top of the mountain for, what, another seven months? Mm-hmm. Well, no, it was, it, um, yeah, they landed in the seventh month on the 17th day. So now they're already at the second month, 27th day. So yeah, they've been there seven, five to seven months. Well, the waters don't completely dry until the first month, the first day of the month. So uh-huh. one, one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in the second month, on the 27th day of the so month, the earth Nissan? had dried out. Is that the first month? It'd be the first of Nisan, right? Which is, uh, yeah, the, the... The 14th of Nisan is the, Passover. Correct. Then God said to Noah, although this Noah was not aware of any of this since Moses was still... No, but, but we're trying future, because but, Moses is given that law. Right. We, it's important. These The Lord puts these dates in here for a reason. Yeah, Moses was given these dates when he wrote this, wrote all this down. Um then God said to Noah, uh, again, this is second month, 27th day of the month, bearing in mind that the, the ark was been resting on the mountaintop for seven months by this point. Yeah. Um, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. I want to remind everybody who is listening to this and picturing all of these animals living on this ark. They were not carnivorous at this point. Mm -hmm. There were no predators. Right. Um, All of the animals were friendly towards man and man and they trusted man. They, They all ate grass. At this point, it's only after the flood that we start to see predation take mm-hmm. place. Yeah. Verse uh, 20, Then Noah built an altar to Yahweh and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And uh, again, the law had not yet been given to Noah, so he didn't know which were clean and unclean. God told no, him. No, that's true. But, but Moses would have specified that for his readers. Yes, that that's very true. But at the same time, if Noah was instructed... You know, I want these certain animals by sevens and these certain animals just Mm -hmm. a male and a female. Then Noah may have suspected there's something special about these guys. Right, right. But we also know, going back to uh, Cain and Abel, that the idea of sacrifice was a very early one. Right. The shedding of blood was required. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and And when Yahweh smelled the pleasing aroma, Yahweh said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Well, yeah, no kidding there. Um, And the word translated curse can also mean dishonor. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Okay, and my app just jumped. Okay, there we go. I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever strike, never again. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. You know, it's interesting, this line about man's heart being evil from his youth. Mm -hmm. 
because there's a, a an idea of the age of accountability. Mm-hmm. And we tend to think of it as somewhere around nine years, 10 years, 12 maybe, somewhere in there as a, an adolescent grows that he or she now knows right from wrong mm-hmm. and therefore is now responsible for his or her free will actions. Being able to understand the consequences and... Uh, yeah, yeah, so I wonder if that's inherent within this from his youth, not yeah. from babyhood. Right, it's implied. But we all know we're all born in sin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's implied. Um, this is one of the mysteries of the Bible, and I think this is one of those mysteries that argues that the Bible has not been edited over the course of history, because yeah. it's certainly something that people have asked questions about for a very long time. Early on in Christian history, um, it became a doctrine that you needed to be baptized to be saved, and that infants who died before they were baptized were, well, sadly, um, Born in sin, not baptized, and that baby, that infant, who was barely self-aware, uh, is according to doctrine still held by some some Christian denominations, yeah. uh, condemned to hell. Well, how is that just? Well, certainly, if somebody had chose to uh, edit the Bible at some point in history, they could have addressed that question yeah. and interpolated something. But it's not. It's not in there. We don't know. All we can do is trust that God is ultimately and just objectively just and fair, that he's not going to condemn those who are innocent. Exactly. He knows our hearts. And I know that there are some parents who have children who are born with uh, limitations, Mm -hmm. very special, wonderful children that uh, don't quite fit in. And those parents may be wondering, how does my child have an age of accountability? Mm Mm-hmm. Only the Lord knows. Exactly. But uh, I was curious to see how the Septuagint translates this. The ah. Brenton says, and verse uh, 21, And the Lord God smelled a smell of sweetness. Mm-hmm. And the Lord God, having considered, said, I will not any more curse the earth because of the works of men, because the imagination of man is intently bent upon evil things, from his youth. Mm-hmm. I will not therefore any more smite all living flesh as I have done. Yeah, the, the Lexham uh, English Septuagint, which is a, a more modern yeah. translation of the Septuagint, renders that verse. Uh, and the Lord God smelled a sweet smell, and the Lord God, having pondered it, spoke, I will never curse the earth any more because of the deeds of humans, because the intention of humankind is inclined attentively on the on the evil things from youth. Inclined attentively, the imagination from Brenton. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that really sort of gives a different spin to that. Mm-hmm. And, and he's right. We humans tend to self-interest at the expense of all others. It is only, and I think that's why the commands that we were given by God boil down to two in the words of Jesus, which is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, be willing. There's no greater uh, there, no greater love than a man who lays down his life for his friends, or one who lays down his or her life for their friends. Amen. And Amen. that is not our natural inclination. We are inclined to want to do what's best for us, regardless of how that affects anyone else. <laughs> That's why capitalism works, because it's based on the idea of uh, self-interest. And that's why socialism does not. Right, because we're still self-interested. It's just you consolidate the power in the hands of a few people. We're all equal. I'm just a little more equal than you are. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading some stories last night on um, my my mother's ancestors. Uh, Her grandfather emigrated from what is now Moldova. They were some part of the German migration from... uh, uh, under Catherine the Great, into the area of around Odessa, uh, an area called Bessarabia, which is kind of on the border between Ukraine and Moldova. Mm-hmm. And in the 1890s, it became pretty clear that things were changing. The special Boy, exemptions howdy. given to the Germans there were gone. And so a lot of the Germans, seeing which way the wind was blowing, um, got out of there and came to the United States. Some of them continued on into Canada. Uh, the, the prairies, the plains of the Dakotas and uh, Canada, very much like the... Um, the steppe, the prairies in, in mm-hmm. Ukraine. They're filled with Mennonites. Yeah, yeah. So, but but there were a lot of Germans who stayed. And what they went through after the 1890s, you know, going through World War One, and then you know, up to 1930s, and, you know, seeing the starvation of the Ukrainians around them. And yeah, not, not pleasant. 
And so the, there were a few who actually went back to their area and what they had to endure through the socialist system of the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. not, not pleasant at all. So uh, anyway, that I know that's a rabbit trail here, but when you- when What you, would our, what would a <laughs> podcast be without a few bunnies? Right. I mean, come on. That's what the pilgrims in the um, Massachusetts Bay Colony discovered because they thought, look- we're all Christians here. We're all serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll all work for the common good. We'll all contribute to the the, the, the central granary, and we'll all share as we, you know, from each according to his uh, gifts to each according to his needs. Well, I found out after a very short while that the single fellas were resentful because they're working just as hard as the married guys, but the married guys were taking home a lot of extra because they had wives and children. Yeah. So the single guy's like, why should I work to feed his family? even though they were Christians. Yeah. And the colony yeah, exactly. eventually almost starved. Well, until- it was modeled after first century Christianity, where it was a communal uh, um, right. home church environment where everybody, they would oftentimes sell their homes and all their goods and just right. everybody shared. But what they missed on it was that it was voluntary. Yes, exactly. It wasn't required. Yeah. So because our hearts tend toward evil continually, capitalism says, okay, look, work like crazy and you get to keep your increase. If you work harder, you get more stuff. Yeah. Now, we then are called upon to give voluntarily of the extra to those in need, but we're not condemned or compelled to do so by, because again, you put that power in the hands of a few and you wind up with a, well, the Soviet Union. So true. And it's not good. So. Well, we'll go to Genesis 9 now. Hey, we made it through an entire (laughs) chapter. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Genesis 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What wonderful words. Yes. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, tell me, when the first uh, command was given to Adam and Eve, Mm -hmm. didn't it include and take dominion? Yes. Well, notice that's not here. That's true. Is that possibly because mankind had given it up to something else? Mm. Yeah, there are some who teach that, especially um, in the dominionist movement, that uh, we had been deceived by Adam, or Adam had been deceived by by Satan into giving up dominion. Hmm. Adam was the co-regent or or the steward of the earth, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And he'd given up that power when he let the Nakash trick him. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but I just found that interesting. It's one of those things has that always been missing from there. Yeah, yeah. The command to go out and take dominion yeah. is not there. But anyway, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you. <coughs> you okay? Mm-hmm. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. And upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Now, that can mean several things. Mm -hmm. Uh, First of all, we suddenly see that they're going to run away from him. Mm -hmm. But being in Noah's hand can mean that he now has power over them in that he can slay them. Mm -hmm. and they know it, or he is now responsible for them. It could be all of the above, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I'm going to repeat that. Mm -hmm. Every, underline that word. So Noah didn't eat kosher. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. You know, I wonder... um, the because because I've heard it taught as well that before the flood that a, there were no uh, carnivorous animals but it it seems here from early in Genesis nine that it was just humans that didn't eat meat before the flood. Well, we don't know that. We don't know that it it seems to me that the very fact that we don't have predation on the ark. Either the Lord stopped it, Mm -hmm. or it didn't come into existence until after the flood. Mm -hmm. That before the flood, man ate only grains, and perhaps as we see in the millennial kingdom, 
that animals eat mm-hmm. only grain. Right. The wolf lies down with the lamb. Yes. Yeah. I know <laughs> that that darn Mandela keeps trying to mess things up and tell us it's a lion and a lamb. It's, no, it was always wolf and lamb. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's a really interesting thing. Again, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Right. And as I gave you the green plants, so previously man mm-hmm. had been given plants to eat, I give you everything. Mm-hmm. Underline, I give you everything. Mm-hmm. But right. you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is, its blood. Mm-hmm. That, I believe, and I'm going to have you expound on this, is because the pagans did this. Yeah, I've not studied that a lot. I know there are still cultures to this day that will uh, take blood and uh, and eat it. Uh, in fact, when we were in England, one of the things we were offered almost at every breakfast, would you like some blood pudding? No, no thanks. I don't We're going to really, pass on that. Yeah, yeah. I'll take some more yogurt, thanks. Or blood sausage. Is blood really, sausage, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, it was... Uh, there there were certain practices by the pagans that, that resulted in God issuing decrees that we'll get into in the book of Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy. That only makes sense when you understand what the pagans did, uh, were, were doing with their sacrificial animals. Right. Uh, one, For example, the prohibition on pork may well be because, um, as some scholars have noted, pigs were primarily bred in the ancient world to offer as sacrifices to the dead. I mean, that was mainly their, their purpose. They didn't do barbecue back in ancient Canaan. They cut them up and, and sacrificed them and, and turned them into um, sa- sacrifices. And it had broth that would sit for three days. They would, uh, and, you know, this, it, with the tainted broth that mm-hmm. Isaiah mentions in That's Isaiah That's why there were so many pigs in Gadara. Right, exactly. And then you notice that the, mad, the, the demoniac was among the tombs. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which is where these rituals for the dead were performed, obviously. So... Yeah, I, I don't know about blood specifically. That's not something I've researched specifically. But I suspect that there's something specific about blood that got, that made it uh, pro, that forced God to prohibit it or compelled Him to prohibit it. Well, extra biblical sources um, seem to indicate that prior to the flood, that the hybrids yes. began cannibalism. We talked about that uh, two weeks ago when yeah. we read from First Enoch, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So yes, there's something there, and uh, as he points out, the the that is its life, that is the blood, its blood. There's something more to blood than just carrying oxygen to all of our tissues. Very much so, and and the very one of the first times we actually see it really mentioned in the Bible is when the blood, uh, the earth swallows up Abel's blood, mm-hmm. and God later comes and says, "His blood cries to me from the ground." Right, right, and we see how important this is when we read uh, verse five here. Exactly, yeah. and verse five is, and your lifeblood for your lifeblood and for your lifeblood i will require require a reckoning from every beast i will require it and from man from his fellow man i will require a reckoning for the life of man i'm going to go on whoever mm-hmm. sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for god made man in His own image. Yeah, back to verse 5. This really emphasizes how important it is. From every beast, I will require it. Mm -hmm. So a tiger mauls a human. Yes, uh, the tiger has to die. Exactly. That's how important the shedding of human blood is. And sadly, in our modern world, well, (laughs) all throughout history, we've made almost an industry of shedding the blood of fellow humans. Here in America, we do it in a very clinical setting, and we even use taxpayer money to uh, help yeah. certain organizations do it on a whole-scale operation. But war and the killing of others, sacrificing humans for yes. other gods. Yes. yes, the sacrifice of humans is something that uh, we, we'll get to when we get into Leviticus. Well, I think later on, especially during Joshua, it's clear that there are times when the Lord does call upon mankind right. to engage in warfare. But this idea of just, these are hate crimes. Let's face it. Mm-hmm. I, I I shed your blood because I don't like you. I shed your blood because you made me mad. I shed your blood because I need a sacrifice to please for, my God. To please my God, yes. So, yeah, for every shedding of human blood, there is a reckoning. And uh, even, from, even from beasts. And why? Because God made man 
in his own image. Not that we look like God, like we said before, it's because we are God's image bearers. We carry his banner with us wherever we go. Yes. And as his representatives, if someone is to lay their hand against us and claim our lives, well, yeah, there will be a reckoning required from that person or that beast. Yeah. You know, I, out of curiosity, I'm going to the Brenton Septuagint again and taking a look at chapter 9. And do you know, in verse 7, here's what it says. Hmm. And again, remember that this is from the Greek done in, what was it, the 4th century? 5th Third- century? Third century okay. BC. Yeah. But it was before Christ. Yes, a couple hundred years at least. So verse seven. But do ye increase and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over it? Ah, okay. Interesting. Now the Lexham English Septuagint does not include dominion. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. But you increase and multiply and fill the earth and multiply upon the earth. Hmm. Yeah. Makes you wonder. Yeah, it, it really, really does. Um, looking to see what the section what was the verse with the blood, uh, verses five and six. But flesh with blood of life ye shall not eat, for your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of all wild beasts, and I will require the life of a man, at the hand of his brother man. He that sheds man's blood instead of that blood shall be his own shed. For in the image of God I have I made man. Now understand that this is a word for word mm-hmm. translation. So you you get these odd sort of Yoda clunky. moments. <laughs> <laughs> Believe why should I you? <laughs> Where did I leave off? Uh, verse verse uh, seven. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply. In it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, mind you, when he's talking to the sons and Noah, he's speaking to the heads of the household. Right. Because the wives are also there. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you. Interesting. The animals are part of this covenant. Mm hmm. The birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. Hmm. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said this is the sign of the covenant that I make between you, between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Underline this verse. Mm -hmm. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Underline that because the enemy has taken The rainbow. He has taken God's bow, which is our promise, Mm -hmm. and he has supplanted it. It's not a coincidence that this has been taken as that symbol of um, the LGBTQ and uh, an acronym now that's up to about 27 letters. Take back the rainbow. Amen. Amen. It's, I think, (laughs) the enemy's got to be laughing about this because the bow, of course, the weather god, the storm god, Hadad, Baal, Satan. Um, Yeah, when do you see the rainbow? After the rain. Who brings the rain? According to the pagan beliefs, well, the storm god, who Jesus identified as Satan. Exactly. That's why I say the Lord over and over is saying, not only did I create everything, I am also the storm god. Mm -hmm. I control all of this. Right. Um, I have, verse 13, I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth, me and the earth. Mm -hmm. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Every time you see a rainbow, remember, God sees it too. Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm. And it reminds him of his promise. Yeah. Verse 16, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it 
and remember the everlasting covenant between, between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. How are we doing on a time? We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Okay. So we've got time to get into this very interesting It is encounter. a very interesting yes. encounter. Okay, chapter eight, uh, 9, verse 18. The sons of Noah went forth from the ark. Who went, sorry, the sons who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. It's in here mm-hmm. to remind everybody because Canaan becomes very important. Yes. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these, by the way, there was no hanky-panky amongst these three sons. One of the wives was not carrying serpent seed in oh, her belly. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, yeah. yeah the wives I, gave birth to sons and daughters who were sired by Noah's yeah, sons. Yeah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right. They're, they're, and Sharon mentions this because the question is uh, when going back to Genesis 6, if there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, also after the days of Noah, when the sons of God went into the daughters of man, well, as Mike Heiser points out, the word translated when can also be read whenever. Whenever, exactly. So, and that's how I believe it should be translated. Right. Now, were there giants in the land later? Well, maybe yes, but as my research has shown that we included in the book, um, the forthcoming book, Veneration, that the verses, the the phrases applied to the people of the land who were seen by the um, spies sent in the land by Moses, Numbers thirteen with thirty three, where they they make reference to the Nephilim. The sons of Anak mm-hmm. are there. That phrase, and also later in Second um, Samuel, where Mo, David and his men take down Goliath and his brothers, and they're called descendants of the giants or sons of the giants. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the Hebrew, it's literally descendants of the Rapha, uh, descendants of the Rephaim. Yes. Were they literal blood descendants? Not necessarily, because in 2 Samuel, the phrase, (coughs) excuse me, translated uh, is not Bene Ha Rapha, it's Yelade Ha Rapha. And Yelade is a phrase, a word that's used for like a retainer or a house slave. Yes. Someone who's born into the household of someone else. I'm raising my hand because I want to speak as a geneticist (coughs) now. Excuse me. We're now aware of something called epigenetics. Right. It means beyond the gene translation itself, switching genes on or off, altering the way that they are translated, and even beyond that, how they are um, later on uh, edited by smaller enzymes that take what's been translated and alter that. Okay. We now know that behaviors by the father prior to, within two weeks, two to three weeks prior to inseminating a mm-hmm. woman, can alter that semen, alter those uh, um, uh, cells so that the sperm themselves are epigenetically different. Hmm. Hmm. Had he not engaged in those activities, so could be so anything. I from... believe that the second incursion occurred through what are called succubi and incubi, hmm. and, other, and and also through other uh, ritualistic sex acts okay. that altered the women and the men epigenetically. That is intriguing and making is... you a spiritual descendant. Of of the Rafa, ah. the Raphaim, right? Um, the and I, I mentioned that because we said, well, you know, doesn't the Bible tell us that uh, that Goliath was uh, what you know four cubits in a span, which is uh, what that's uh, like eight and a half feet tall or something like that, or there's six cubits. I think he was like thirteen feet tall or something. Well, that well, six but, cubits in a span but, or something. But anyway, he yeah, was early, yeah, early early on, the oldest Hebrew text I think are heaven. He's it taller than a doctor. Four cubits in a span, which is like six foot eight or something. Which considering that most skeletons of, of uh, well, Israelites found from the time. four cubits in a span is bigger than three cubits in a span. I said four. Uh, the other one I said was six. Oh, six sorry. Yeah, six cubits in a span. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the, the difference is uh, that that spiritual descendant uh, is really the key component, is really the it key is for me. issue here, um, that they were following these pagan 
uh, practices, these occult practices. Yes. And they to may become, have been taller. It's hard to say. Epigenetically, it may have switched on genes that actually made them taller than the average human. The right. average human back then was like five, five and a half feet tall. Right. Yeah. Uh, what I, and re, this research went into last clash of the Titans, five foot two to five foot four. Yeah. Back in the so day. If so if you were six feet tall, you were pretty tall. Right. So if Goliath, according to the oldest Hebrew text was six, eight, and the guy is like five, two, you know, that would be like me come, coming face to face with uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah, exactly. So pretty tall. But again, the spiritual descendancy, the spiritual ancestry of the Nephilim, the Rephaim, the spirits of those hybrids that were wiped out in the flood and then the, the spirits condemned to wander the earth until the judgment that's the, the these entities were worshiping these these later sons of the rafa sons of the anak uh were worshiping them and that's that's what we should take away from these sons of the giants it's like me you know i qualify to be a son of the american revolution doesn't mean i'm actually george washington's descendant but it's it's a class that i could belong to if i chose mm-hmm. to um, Goliath and his brothers, Ishbi Benov and those guys were apparently part of this w- cast of warriors and perhaps even a warrior mm-hmm. cult. But your point, I think, is well taken that epigenetically speaking, the rituals that they performed exactly. in a cult worship because that they were part of. why do them over and over again if they had no benefit? Right. Exactly. Exactly. We just like it is all. <laughs> we like walking in circles. It's so just, there you go. So yeah. that's that's what I believe about this second incursion. So no, I do not believe that there was some sort of hybrid, you know, fetus growing in one of the the, the son's wives. Right. Um, Good so, point, yes. Verse 19. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. How are we doing on time? Um, well, we, we can finish the chapter. I like this verse. Noah began to be a man of the soil. Mm-hmm. Now, he ate only plants prior to the flood. Right, right. So it's possible that he bought his food from somebody else. Yeah, went down to the IGA. Well, you know, I mean, uh, there were people who were, seriously, I mean, yeah. he, he may have been a carpenter. It could be that he had that skill. What's interesting is that the later um, Mesopotamians remembered that the hero of their flood story, whose name was Utnapishtim, was the, the last king of a city called Shurapak which is in Iraq. They found the remains of that city. And if he was the king, he was probably not somebody who went out and gardened on his own. Probably not. But uh, what th- was interesting about the remains of um, Shurapak that they found is that they found the oldest grain bins ever. Now, back in the day, they didn't build them up out of, uh, you know, sheet metal or whatever. Uh-huh. They, they built them, they dug them into the ground and lined these pits with with ceramic, you know, with fired brick. But knowing that he was told a hundred years in advance. Yes. He had a hundred years to save up food for the journey. That's the interesting thing about this, you know, where archaeology may, in fact, support the flood story without even knowing it. So yeah. if, yes, he was the king of Shurapak and he, okay, we're going to make these really huge grain bins and store all this. What? We just eat it as we need it. That's uh, the rest we throw out in the food. No, no, yeah. we're going to store some extra here mm-hmm. because something's coming that I can't tell you about. <laughs> yeah, entirely, entirely possible. Yeah, interesting. Verse 20, Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. Mm-hmm. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now, there is a euphemism here. Mm-hmm. Well, should we maybe go down through yeah, uh, we will. Uh, the, then the Shem of and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. Mm. And let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Interestingly, the uh, word for enlarge in Hebrew sounds like Yepheth. Huh. Yeah, that <laughs> is God, interesting. May God, Yepheth, Yepheth. Yeah. Um, now, as you were saying, there's a, there's a euphemism here. I want to just end it out. After okay. the flood, Noah lived 350 years, so he had plenty of time to have more sons. Mm-hmm. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. 
Yes. So the question then is why, what did Ham do and why was Canaan cursed because of it? Yeah. He, it was more than just seeing dad without his clothes on. Right. And then, you know, going outside and laughing. That seems pretty harsh punishment for just seeing dad, you know, making a fool of himself. Yeah. And, and Derek's referring to this. Their faces were turned, uh, sorry. And he saw the nakedness and told his two brothers outside, hey, right. you guys, you guess what I did? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look at dad. He's laying there There's naked. There's more than that. I think oh, it's, no, absolutely. look at what I did. No, that that's exactly the point. I think the way it's been taught in order to clean it up, because again, the, and this is where understanding the worldview of the ancients helps us to make sense of an otherwise mysterious, cryptic section of, of, of scripture. Why would Noah curse, curse Canaan yes. for something his father did when, when Noah was passed out? Think about this. The three sons were looking at Noah and say, okay, he's 600 years old. How long is dad going to be around? When dad is gone, the three of us will be kings of the world. Yes, that's exactly how they saw it. Because back in the day, their dad was king of the city. Mm -hmm. And now they're the only ones. Right. So whatever we do, you know, we, we are going to be the kings of the world. So who is, but the, who's the big king who inherits from dad. dad. Yeah. And, uh, the we we see this uh, euphemism played out elsewhere in the Old Testament. The, the the key here is seeing the nakedness or uncovering the nakedness of his father. That is a euphemism in the Old Testament that means having sexual relations with his father's wife. Exactly. This was an incestuous act by Ham. Yes, it was a way to say, "I am now the king." Right. You can't even protect your wife. Right. Exactly. It was making a cuckold and, and, and saying that, that the, the old king is now impotent. And the examples that we see in Scripture, we see this in uh, uh, the story of Jacob, where his oldest son, Reuben, who was the firstborn, should have been the main heir that passed to Judah, essentially, uh, because Reuben went in and slept with Jacob's concubine, Bilhah. And Jacob found out about it and said, well, you know, <laughs> you would have been the heir, but not now because you've defiled my couch. Yep. We see it in the story of David, where his son Absalom, mm -hmm. who he welcomes back. Absalom had um, had to flee because Absalom killed, uh, uh, was it uh, Amon, who uh, uh, raped uh, Tamar? Yes. And so Absalom ran north and stayed because with Because Absalom was in love with Tamar. Hmm. That's what some think. Yeah, could be, could be. So Absalom ran north to the, to the kingdom of Geshur, uh, which is on the north uh, slope. In fact, it's where later Bethsaida was located. They found that interesting city gate with the uh, oh yes, yes, yes inscription yes. of the the bull with the yes, yeah, yes, the, 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 yeah, yes. Do we have that on next year's list? Uh, I hope so. Me, yeah, me too. It's it's close to uh, Cap uh, Capernaum. Yes. So. Uh, anyway, he welcomes Absalom back home, and then Absalom tries to usurp David's authority. David has to flee, and then Absalom sets up a tent on the roof of the palace and goes into all of David's concubines. For all the world to see. Exactly. That's what was happening. This is like a dog marking his territory, mm -hmm. and it's about that gross. Exactly. So, now, mind you, Ham was the second son. He's mm -hmm. listed second here. Right. So that's why he did this, mm -hmm. because Shem was the heir. Yes, Exactly. And Canaan apparently was the product of this uh, this union, mm -hmm. which is why Canaan was cursed because of, <laughs> well, Noah's son got Noah's wife pregnant. Yes, that's what many scholars who you know understand the original language and the context of it. Right, that's what's believed. And Canaan is listed in the, and we'll get into this when we get into the table of nations. Uh, so obviously we're not going to get Genesis 10 and 11 today. I didn't think we would. No, no. We'll push that off till next week. But that's week. good because that's a big topic. It, it really is. The table of nations and, and Mike Heiser's presentation and the uh, Lubbock conference. Boy, Heiser's just been all over. He's all over. Um, there will be a DVD set, by the way, from this year's uh, Sons of God, Giants of Old Conference. This oh, is the good, first time good, good, good. that uh, Dr. Judd Burton has uh, arranged for that to be done. So that will be... Uh, available within a couple of months, as soon as they're architected. But Mike's presentation is well worth the set alone uh, because he goes into what it means when Canaan is, is listed as the father of, um, well, the Amorites, mm -hmm. and the Sidonians, yes, yes. And, uh, and so on and so on, uh, the Hittites and all of those. Uh, because the Amorites, it's 
common knowledge amongst scholars that the Amorites, even though they're, they're allegedly now, allegedly, they're, they're listed in the Bible as descendants of Ham through Canaan, um, but they didn't speak a Hamitic language. They spoke a Semitic language. Yeah. And they worshipped Semitic gods. Yes. So why is that? Well, we'll talk about that when we get into the Table of Nations. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of meat coming up yet to discuss. Boy, such good stuff. And again, this is all here in His Word. And and I know that I was guilty of this because I read through the Bible, you know, a lot, several times when I was growing up, and and I thought, well, I've got a handle on it. You will never ever get everything that out of this that's in there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We will still be asking the Lord questions about this throughout eternity. Yeah, yeah. There, are, and that's the exciting thing is that uh, no matter how many layers you you peel, there there's still more onion there. And and here's the thing: <laughs> think about this. The Lord Himself is logos. He is the Word. So the Word of God. Mm-hmm. What we're given here, the written just tiny, tiny fraction of the personality of Jesus Christ. That's what this book is all about. Mm -hmm. These 66 books are just the tiniest peak at the depth and richness and infinite diversity and love and compassion and, and complexity of our Savior. If you really love Jesus, if you say you love him, you sing that song about how he loves you and you want to love him back, read his word. Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. you read, This is his love letter to you. He's telling you all about himself. And we should all aspire to that, to do the best we can to understand him. Yeah. Because there's, how else do we, we set our course? We don't. Yeah. I mean, if we are doing what's right in our own eyes, I, well, I know that we are adrift. And sadly, there are a lot of Christian denominations that are doing that right now. They I, cut themselves loose from the Word of God. Exactly. Well, I've had... Yeah. Let me tell you my ideas and my life, because my life is what really matters, mm-hmm, some mm-hmm. preachers say. I've, uh, I've spoken to a number of people who've written to me or said to me privately at conferences, I just want to hear from God. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Guess what? Yeah, it's right here. It's right here. Yeah. The prophets who heard from God directly were generally not very happy. They had very difficult lives. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I want to lie on my side and, you know, bake things yeah. on dung. And, no, yeah. uh-uh. Go into a city of pagans and tell them they're all going to die <laughs> yeah. unless they repent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not, not fun if you hear directly from God. No. But there are people who are hearing directly from small g gods all all the time, all the time, and, right up to today. And that's the, that's the point here. When John told us to test the spirits because not all are from God, um, that's a quick way toward oblivion, towards destruction. If you start following what you're hearing whispered in your ear without cross checking it against the word of God, yeah. like the Bereans did like to the, the preaching Bereans of did. Paul. Yep. What you're saying sounds good, Paul, but we're just going to double check just to be sure. And Paul loved that. Yes, yes. And we should likewise. So, yeah, if you, if you uh, catch something that we miss uh, or something we misspeak, we won't. Boy, we're we won't, happy to hear from you. We won't be upset because no. we don't want to be wrong. We do not presume to speak where God is silent. We do not want to add anything or take anything away from his word. And speak, by the way, if you want to double check the. Uh, interpretation on the uh, on the the uncovering the nakedness of Noah um, Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 goes into this where it specifically talks about uncovering the nakedness of your father's wife or of your you know and, and so on mm-hmm. it, it basically in the law is a prohibition against doing the very thing that uh, ham appears to have done yeah. and and you have to wonder too if that was an activity pre-flood. And he was simply, well, everybody did this, so I'm going to do this now. Yeah. it Well, clearly it was something that was common enough in the ancient Near East that Moses and then the later chroniclers didn't feel the need to explain. Yeah. They yeah, exactly. They didn't need to you know, add in parentheses, the reason Absalom went into David's uh, concubines was to make a political statement. No, everybody knew what was going on. The old king is impotent. I'm the dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... Yeah. Uh, well, we've got a lot of things coming up that... Uh, Why do we ever? Um, We're busy. 
Yeah, as, uh, see, the True Legends Conference, just a few weekends away, about three weeks from today as we record yeah, this. Yeah, well, three weeks from today will be on the Sunday of that weekend. It, right, so, right. So three um, weekends from this weekend. Yeah, exactly. So about two and a half weeks away, we're going to be heading down to Branson mm-hmm. for, to the Mansion Theater. And I believe there are still a few tickets left, but Not you very can. Many. Yeah, exactly. So grab them if they're available. But you can also sign up for streaming. Mm-hmm. Streaming video is. Um, and they're offering a special deal where if you order the streaming video for this year's conference, you can watch last year's conference right now as uh, at no extra charge. That's amazing. So you get two conferences for the price of one if you sign up for streaming video at the True Legends Conference. So last year's conference on transhumanism mm-hmm. you gets uh, Sharon's amazing presentation that had... Uh, one of the Dr. Hugo de Garris, one of the world's leading researchers into artificial intelligence, shaking his head afterwards, saying, "I didn't know a lot of this stuff." <laughs> so, you can find that the uh, the uh, incredible Next Generation panel with the Fall Brothers, Josh Peck, uh, and uh, some other uh, Gans Shimura, and some other really intelligent young men mm-hmm. talking about uh, where AI and where the transhumanist movement is leading us. Uh, all of that for free if you sign up for the uh, 2019 conference, which is coming up in just a few weeks. Then the week after that. Uh, I'll be going to uh, the Fresno, California area. It's a conference um, that Pastor Greg Crocker of Cross Point Church in Sanger, California, is putting together. He just he's been following us for a year. I remember he emailed me about a year ago, and I'd kind of forgotten because we we get a lot of email. I try to pay attention and answer as best I can, but he had, it's so hard to do. But he had gotten in touch with Troy Anderson, who is um, a Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist. Yes, he's, he is. A co-author of a couple of books with Paul McGuire, uh, The Babylon Code and Trumpocalypse. Funny name. Great I name. I love it. And um, they're putting on a prophecy conference in in uh, the, the, at their church. And I volunteered to go ahead and speak like six times. So, you know, you get Maximum Gilbert from that uh, <laughs> conference. Uh, if you're anywhere in California in the Fresno area, it uh, will be well worth it, I think, Um because Paul will be talking, Troy will be talking as well. Yeah, if I can get my book fish, finished in time, I'll go just to hang out with you, but probably will not be there. Mm. But you are going to talk lots. And I tell you what, if you have never, ever been there when Derek speaks live, <laughs> he preaches, buddy. He <laughs> preaches. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from because that's not my... It's the Holy Spirit taking hold, honey. And the good thing is that you know to get out of the way. Well, praise God that he uh, kind of shoves me to the side, because uh, if it was me trying to put on a show, it would not be, uh, yeah, it, it, well, it, it would be for the wrong reason. passionate man, long. let's just say um, Then we, we skip a week so I can go to St. Louis and take Nicole to the Carbs Cardinals game. Yay! Yeah, since the two of them are fighting for the National League Central, that'll be a big deal. Then the Unsealed Scroll Prophecy Conference in San Antonio, the first weekend in October. That That's one, a, That is incredible. Yeah, Paul McGuire will be there again, but uh, our old friends, uh, Carl Gallops and uh, Messianic Rabbi Zev Parat. Um, boy, so many, uh, Jonathan Kahn, Ellie mm-hmm. Marzulli, uh, Bill Salas, uh, Ryan Peterson, author of the Nephilim, uh, uh the judgment of the Nephilim. Uh, yes. Yes. And Jim Barfield of the Copper Scroll Project. Yes. Casper McLeod. I mean, this is going to be such an amazing gathering and the hotel, uh, We're getting the band back together, <laughs> Elwood. <laughs> Uh, the Grand Hyatt on the Riverwalk, the San Antonio Riverwalk, is so beautiful. And I know we won't have, we'll barely have time to see it. Maybe that Thursday evening that we're there, we can see a little of it because Friday through Sunday, we will be really busy. We will. But uh, that is going to be an amazing thing. Uh, they're running a special offer, by the way, through the end of August on the registration and the streaming video they're offering for $35. That is, that's through half August of what. The the cheapest streaming video ever is. Right. $35 is crazy cheap. And if you use promo code Gilbert20, Gilbert20, you can take another 20% off of that. Wow. Yeah. Sharon and I are going to be speaking at a, a special luncheon on Sunday. So this will be our first time doing a presentation or speaking before a group together. So that should be fun. Uh, uh, you I know, wonder what we'll say. I have no idea. I can't wait to see what we say. We'll probably just make it up as we go, That's which is how usually we what we do. And then It'll the here- be Blather City, folks. And then the uh, the Hear the Watchman conference in Los Angeles will kind of close out the uh, conference season for this year. Uh, well, Los Angeles, it's uh, Irvine, Orange County. Yeah, uh, it's right, right at the Ontario, uh, the airport, the John Wayne Airport. Yeah, so Ontario. you can fly right into John Wayne and go t- right yeah, into the airport because it's literally across the street from the airport. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that'll make the presentations really interesting. Every time a flight comes in, oh. got to pause for fifteen seconds while the plane lands. Uh, probably not. Um, hear the watchman.com to sign up for that. And uh, again, Gilbert 20 saves you uh, 20% on, uh, 
streaming video, 20 bucks off the uh, registration. Which is a deal. Yeah. Which is a deal. We got, we got all those details at the, uh, the calendar at gilberthouse.org. Yep. You can find, again, everything we do there. And when we have the complete itinerary and the registration for next year's Israel uh, tour and the Sardinia extension, we'll have all of that there as well. Yeah. Right now, they're still putting together all of the goodies that we're going to offer. Yeah. So trying to figure out how we can fit it all into oh, a reasonable amount so of time. We're so excited because Aaron Lipkin, once again, is uh, hosting. The, he, he's taking care of all of the details in Israel. And our friend, amazing woman, Paula, mm-hmm. is taking care of everything in Sardinia. So they're yeah. working together. Yeah, some great, great stuff. So we'll have the best tour guides available in Israel oh, and on Sardinia. Trust me, that yeah. is so true. Yeah. Father, we thank you for granting us this time together today. And Lord, we just pray for your blessing on all those who truly seek your will and your face. We know that this world, Lord, is sometimes a very difficult road to walk. You have blessed us, but we know there are those listening who are struggling financially, struggling emotionally, family issues, health issues. We know that there are people in other parts of the world where it's not acceptable to worship as we do, to study your word as we do. And Lord, we, we, we just pray that you remind us not to take this for granted and to pray for the protection and safety of those who are preaching the gospel in places where it is unsafe. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Syria and in Iraq, where things over the last, well, 20 years have become extremely, extremely dangerous. We pray for the, the church in Africa, Lord, where the, the growth in the number of believers is, is just exploding, Father. We pray that your spirit moves and to, to drive out the spirits of darkness that have uh, enslaved people in, in so many of those uh, pagan religions there for so many years. We pray for the church in China, Father, where the government there is cracking down, even on house gatherings, that you would give them, that you would conceal them from the eyes of the government, conceal them from the eyes of the enemy. And just, Lord, we pray especially for your spirit. We pray for those in who are longing for something more, something some true, uh, in, in Muslim nations where your your spirit is is inspiring many to come to Jesus Christ through dreams and visions. Lord, we just pray for that that movement to continue. We know things are ramping up, Father. We hear reports. We see the news. We know that the enemy is moving towards a final confrontation. But we also know from your word, Lord, that you have already seen the end from the beginning and that your victory is assured. Yes. Lord, we pray for the strength to run the race to our fullest until we reach the end. Whether you come first or whether we are called home first, Lord, help us to run each step, each day, just waiting in joy for the fulfillment of your promise. Lord, we ask for your blessing. We pray for wisdom and discernment, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.